Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello, and welcome to another episode of All Things Policy. I'm Anushka Saxena, a research analyst with the Takshashila Institution's Indo-Pacific Studies program. And I'm joined by Manoj Keval Ramani, the chairperson for the program. Today, we'll be delving into three flagship initiatives launched by Chinese President and CPC General Secretary Xi Jinping, which have gained a lot of traction in the past few months. The Global Security Initiative, the Global Development Initiative, and more recently, the Global Civilization Initiative. Welcome, Manoj. Happy to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much, Anushka. Happy to be here. Right. So let's begin by talking about some of the details of what these initiatives are. Like I mentioned, these are considered she's flagship foreign policy proposals along with the Belt and Road Initiative. And if I'm not wrong, uh, the GDI was announced by Xi first in September 2021 at the UN General Assembly, then the GSI in April 2022 at the Bao Forum, and then the GCI on uh, 15 March 2023 during his speech at the World Political Party's high-level meeting. The GSI was also updated with a concept paper in February 2023. And of course, uh, you've also written an elaborate uh, discussion document for Takshila on it. And all of these are somewhere or the other kind of concerned with navigating the quote unquote changing international landscape in their respective areas and enhancing China centered partnerships that together mitigate the risks and challenges in the current global order in a somewhat people centered manner. So with that very uh, brief backdrop in mind. Could you please tell our listeners a little bit more about what these initiatives entail, what they're meant to achieve and what is the context in which they've been introduced? Over to Thanks so much. Look, in some ways, it's sort of alphabet soup with Chinese characteristics. Uh, so there is uh, BRI, GDI, GSI, GCI, and sure. all of it can be quite confusing in terms of what it means. Because when you read through at least the speeches that Xi Jinping gave when he started to talk about these initiatives, those are all... Uh, Fairly vague and fairly broad uh, ideas that he's put together. I think it's useful to sort of take a step back and start thinking about what exactly is he trying to do with these initiatives. And for that, I think it's useful to first understand what exactly is the mindset through which the Chinese leadership is looking at the world. So you talked about, you know, this great changes that he's talking about uh, Mm -hmm. and sort of turbulence that is taking place in the world. I mean, the way I look at it, the Chinese leadership's worldview, uh, and Xi Jinping talks about this, is that Yes, there is a balance of power shift that is taking place in the world, which is where the balance of power is shifting from the West to the East. I don't know how he's defining that balance of power, but at least economic gravity has shifted away from, say, the transatlantic aspect of the world to uh, the Indo-Pacific. Even the sort of strategic gravity in some ways has shifted away, although, of course, over the last year and a bit with the war in Ukraine, there is a strategic dimension change in sort of Europe also. But that's his first point of view. The second view that he articulates is that there are these four deficits that the world is facing. One is the deficit of development, deficit of peace, deficit of governance, and the deficit of trust. And I think it's useful when he first started talking about these, we looked at these as sort of rhetorical points. Um, I think as GDI, GSI, and GCI have come in, they are specific answers to what Xi Jinping understands by these deficits, or at least what the Chinese leadership understands by these deficits. I shouldn't be saying Xi Jinping, I can't read his mind. Mm -hmm. Um, So at least that is useful for us to keep in mind. The third sort of point is that, you know, the leadership worldview is that, look, yes, China needs to be self-reliant given this turbulent nature of the world, but it also needs to be deeply connected to the world. So therefore, it needs to take certain steps to secure itself because it can't develop in isolation despite all the talk of self-reliance. So therefore, there is an opportunities prism to the world that he looks at it, and there is a Threat prism. The opportunities prism is basically the fact that China has enhanced capacity, enhanced material wealth, enhanced performance legitimacy, which it sort of is trying to bank on. It believes that there is a relative weakness of the US and the middle power lot is anxious about the possibility of sort of a G2 competition, a Cold War as competition. Um, at the same time, there is, you know, certain capacity that the middle powers have where they can engage in certain degree of adventurism and sort of bargaining with these great powers. And the third is that he sees that, look, there is tremendous fissures and polarization that's taken place within democracies, particularly in the West. 
and there is an erosion of this idea that there is a certain democratic model there is an end of history and you know liberal values are at the end of the day what are going to triumph and that creates opportunities for him on the threat side it's fundamentally you know the idea that the us is trying to contain china um i think the threat side is very well captured by chinese foreign minister chin gang after xi jinping's meeting with president putin in march uh, chin gang gave an interview to chinese media uh, in which he made a really interesting sort of assessment of the world uh, where he said that look the principal contradiction in the world and principal contradiction from a marxist perspective is extremely important it's the fundamental problem in the world that underpins everything else and he says that the principal contradiction globally uh, is not about democracy versus autocracy is about uh, you know the struggle between development and containment of development uh and between global justice and power politics which essentially uh, he he's looking at the world not through an, uh, he's arguing that the approach that the world needs to think about is not an ideological values based approach but but an approach of conflict between great powers and within that china is on the side of justice and so on and so forth now it's a very self serving argument uh, mm-hmm. you know um but there's a grain of truth in it that there is a certain degree of containment obviously taking place but there is a certain value based competition also taking place so within this backdrop he's launched these three initiatives like you said that timing comes from 2021 to 2023 so this is a reflection of world view which is not a product of one event such as the ukraine war or such as the sanctions on huawei or something like that uh, or say nancy pelosi's visit to taiwan or xi jinping right now being in the us it is a product of a gradual understanding within beijing of the nature of the world and its competition with the united states i mean with that background i think we can get into specific initiatives right right so i think a lot of the threat perception surrounding containment is uh, not only uh, visible in how these initiatives are articulated and what they perhaps would ultimately uh, want to achieve but also in you know a general conversation surrounding say china scientific and technological progress with xi jinping arguing that the west is kind of trying to strangle hold its uh, process of growth and modernization and on the idea of modernization uh, i think i'll uh, go in reverse talk about the gci first and um, one of the main tenets of gci as was announced in his uh, speech at the political parties meeting was that uh, modernization is not an exclusive patent of small handful of countries and uh, nor is it a single answer question and i'm and um, i think i can safely assume that this is uh, kind of a hit at this western coalition of countries that's kind of um, trying to define modernization in its own way and then uh, restrict china uh, on its own path and in the same uh, breath uh, xi jinping then also defines what modernization means for china and you know how com- staying committed to the right direction right theories and right path is how he projects it and uh, how ultimately this kind of civilizational outreach should reach to other countries to developing countries to countries that would ultimately want to then ally with china once they see what uh, you know what kind of rightful uh, just as you mentioned path he's taking so With that said, I'd like to know more of your thoughts on how attractive this civilizational outreach may be for some of the countries the GCI is targeting, and uh, what exactly does the initiative, in whatever uh, brief it has been introduced, entail, and uh, where where can we see um, future policies surrounding it go? Yeah. Okay. So I think that this is uh, GCI is uh, one of those. again when you read the initial original text of what shi jinping is saying the operative bits are you know some of it is just you know really good sounding rhetoric which is that hey look we are all different civilizations and civilizations need to get along and you know clash of civilizations is not what the times are about it's about civilizations needing to understand coexist be tolerant and all of that which is all perfectly fine what it actually implies is a very subversive message it basically implies like you said that modernization is not just westernization his argument is actually not with westernization his argument is essentially that look there are different historical experiences that different civilizations and i use the word civilization in the context of how one would organize society how one would organize politics how one would organize it one's economy and he is saying look whatever we define as this liberal order of values whether it is say with regard to freedom of speech with regard to freedom of thought with regard to you know freedom of expression all of these ideas that we have which 
since the Second World War have been, you know, if I was to coin them under this rubric of liberal international order, the idea that these are universal, these are sacrosanct and societies must aspire towards this. His argument is, well, that's not the case. You know, and China's development proves this, that this is not the case. Uh, And you should be able to interpret these values within the context of your civilizational experience. Now, that might sound really good to some people. And I do believe that in large parts of the world, particularly the developing world, there'll be some purchase for this particular idea because uh, there is frustration with what is seen as the West's instrumentalizing of human rights and these ideas to sort of pass judgment, you know, restrict finances and all of that thing. So, you know, impose sanctions and things like that, which I think is uh, something that, you know, so therefore this will have some purchase in the developing world. But if you look at it, it's quite a subversive argument because the idea of freedom being something that is, the idea of freedom being something that is, should be circumscribed by simply your civilizational experience can be deeply problematic. So, for example, if you extrapolate it to say that women's rights in a certain society and in a certain country must be based on whatever your civilizational and historical experiences, rights of LGBTQ communities. Uh, Now, should those countries and should those societies have a negotiation amongst themselves to arrive at some of these outcomes, which are, you know, yes, and these are messy things. But... Should you then say that whatever your outcomes are, are perfectly fine, however regressive they may be, because those are part of your civilizational experience is deeply problematic. So I think some of the values based contestation that he's engaging in is essentially the outcome of some of this is this. Again, while it sounds really fine to say that, yes, you must organize your society based on your civilizational experience and nobody must interfere uh, within your internal affairs at a principle level, it's, it's perfectly fine. I don't think that you know, sovereign equality is an important thing and, you know, and uh, interference in internal affairs of countries is problematic. But at the same time, the normalization of something that can be deeply regressive because it is your civilizational experience can be deeply problematic. And that's the kind of world that he is calling for when he's saying, I want a global civilization initiative. So that's the core of the argument, right? So as opposed to universal values, Xi Jinping is saying, We should not be talking about universal values. We should be talking about common values of mankind, right? And those common values, he defines as six common values. Peace, development, fairness, justice, democracy, and freedom. Peace is quite straightforward. Development is quite straightforward. Uh, When it comes to fairness and justice, his argument is that, look, fairness is not just about how you organize societies internally, but also within the international order, uh, which essentially means greater voice for China. And he's hedging that along with greater voice for other developing countries. Likewise, justice is in that context, which I think, again, is something that will be well received in the developing world. Democracy and freedom, deeply challenging because in the Chinese lexicon, I mean, they are arguing that their system is a democracy and every system has a right to be a democracy, you know, which uh, I I think is problematic because at the heart of democracy, I mean, at least in some parts uh, in how we understand popularly is that there has to be representation, there has to be the ability of the people to not just engage with the state, but also be able to secure rights from the state. And the state and the party cannot be beyond, you know, rule of law. I think that's not the case in China, right? The party is no party is essentially, the state is not, but the party is essentially beyond rule of law. So that's the problem. And he's basically saying, you can define your own system. You can have your own thing. I don't have a problem with it. Again, that sounds fine on the surface, but it's challenging. In terms of what could be the possible initiatives under GCI and part of it would be building essential consensus on some of these ideas and trying to have, you know, joint blocks which argue at the UN and push back against what is seen as Western interventionism. But part of it is also in the context of building that consensus, not just at an elite level, but also at a society level. So you will likely, you're likely to see education programs, tourism programs, people to people programs, media, think tank, TV productions, cultural programs, all of those things. Right. to try and talk about this idea of different civilizations. I think it's useful to think about it from the point of view of also whether we are likely to see some, whether this legitimizes some degree of civilizational spheres of influence within certain areas. Mm-hmm. Um, what that means, what that could mean, who knows. But at the heart of it, this is the idea that you're trying to push back and undermine what you see, what Xi Jinping sees as a Western notion of universal values. 
to me a lot of it is liberal values right. uh, and that's why i find it problematic right i think gci to my mind is ironically one of those things where because it is so inclusive it is problematic and i just have a quick follow up on uh, on what you talked about do you think xi jinping has kind of cut himself a check by arguing that the gci is about innovative transformation of fine traditional cultures which is that it's great that these fine traditional cultures exist but then they also have to keep up with the times and transform in a manner that is you know somewhere or the other in tandem with certain liberal values so do you think that xi jinping also has some this or 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 the cpc somewhere has this at the back of their minds that uh, ultimately one day it will come to that challenge between you know what some uh, civilizational cultures would consider as okay but um, say the un led international order would consider regressive and my second kind of more fundamental lay person question is that why does xi jinping think that he can broker this kind of these spheres of civilization and at the same time get away with anything that any the promotion of anything regressive when the un has also for the longest time tried to balance sovereignty with a uh, value with with universal values that would be considered that would be in the interest of any and all people across the world so essentially some would argue that this is she's way of subverting what again he would go on the international for, platform and promote that oh we don't want a we don't want the west to dictate the rules we want the un to dictate the rules so uh, would you would you see that clash yeah look i mean essentially what his argument is that at the united nations uh, it's essentially uh, from his point of view it's essentially been the west which has set the terms of reference of how governance takes place what are the kind of values that are desirable and his argument is that those are no longer you know at no feasible. point are those desirable no no are they feasible nor are they desirable yeah. you know he he says uh, some one some some of his quotes if i can remember correctly is that you know you don't cut your toes to fit in the shoes you yeah. make the shoes that you fit in the toes so you whatever you do has to uh, reflect your national realities and your civilizational experience mm-hmm. and anything else he is defining as essentially extra you know extra civilizational or even uh, when it comes to asia because he talks about there's been an asian civilizations dialogue also mm-hmm. he talks about it as extra regional mm-hmm. essentially to make the argument that whatever our american led values or western values are not are extra regional are not sort of inherent to the asian way of life and you know we need to find our own way at present a lot of this is about essentially undermining and undercutting what he sees as american influence uh, right. in it in terms of organizing of society and you know and he's basically making the case that china's development has shown that you don't need to have uh, you don't need to follow that prescription you can identify your own prescription and i don't need to have a say in what your prescription is at the but at the end of the day we need to work together because working together is beneficial for each of us mm-hmm. till we can keep that bottom line the rest of it is fine now at certain points of time there will be challenges right so for example if the taliban was to organize afghan society in a certain way mm-hmm. talking about a certain degree of you know their experience of you know law and you know their reading of you know islamic tradition and whatever in theory xi jinping should have very little problem with it right because he's saying uh, yet he does when he talks to the taliban he does talk about hey look you know when you form a government you need to have some degree of inclusion and this and that right. so part of this is rhetoric to try and undermine what is seen as the influence of the west part of this is uh, to signal that while we may be concerned about our interests beyond that what you do domestically is not of our interest now that will change as china's engagement in countries deepens you know as its investments deepen as its engagement deepens and that will change and that is a friction that is a sort of uh, reckoning that he will have to eventually uh, deal with but at present i think the objective is to use gci in particular to try and undermine us dominance mm-hmm. uh, ideological dominance by undercutting what are universal values what they and at the un the objective is essentially to push back against any sort of criticism of chinese domestic policies whether it's with regard to hong kong xinjiang tibet wherever else and make the case that look it's legitimate because uh, we have firstly support of so many governments which i think they've done very well in the last Five seven years in right. terms of getting com- countries together to back it. So I think that's the agenda at present, and the modes of that is essentially, like I said, through people to people engagement, 
media, TV, right. whatever, influencing thought and ideas. Seems fair, yes. And on on that point about bringing countries together, I think the other interesting one is uh, the security initiative and uh, some of the core tenets that were, say, highlighted in the GCI concept paper that was uh, released this year are fairly well discussed in Chinese rhetoric, like respecting sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries and abiding by the purposes and principles of the UN Charter. But some others are relatively more uh, debatable, especially as to what they might entail, like developing and following uh, behind the vision of uh, common, comprehensive, cooperative and sustainable security. And so on that, what would you say is Xi Jinping's vision of common and cooperative security? Is it actually getting countries together within their civilizational context to respond to security challenges in the way they see fit while also cooperating uh, within themselves? Or is it more about keeping China's security concerns in mind and then kind of using Chinese backing and influence in traditional and non-traditional security domains to achieve some sort of anti-West goals. Yeah, I mean, look, my my take on GSI is uh, quite straightforward that the primary objective of GSI is essentially to undercut the United States' Indo-Pacific strategy Mm -hmm. and to delegitimize security cooperation with the U.S., in the Indo-Pacific region, which yeah. includes Asia and whatever. I think that's the primary sort of objective. Along with that, of course, there are many sub-objectives, you know, uh, doing this will require res- projecting China as a responsible power, focusing on the UN. It will require creating new multilateral institutions or mechanisms. I mean, we're seeing right now them talking about creating a new framework in the Middle East, mm-hmm. um, possibly getting Iran and the GCC countries together for a dialogue. When that deal, and today as we are talking, um, the Iranian and Saudi foreign ministers are meeting in China and uh, you know there could be talks about reopening embassies uh, and exchanging ambassadors the deadline for that is to do it within two months since the deal was announced in March Uh, and the Chinese government sort of talked about that deal quite uh, they tom tommed it as this big success of GSI actually there's very little that's taken place it's important that Iran and Saudi Arabia are talking you know uh, but that's a dialogue that's been going on for quite some time it's not just something that China did and China did swoop in at the last minute to sort of you know and of course from what we understand, the Saudis wanted China involved. Um, so there is obviously a stake there. I'm not saying that, you know, China has done nothing but is sort of, you know, I think it's played a role in it and I think that's important to recognize. Yet, does that mean that Beijing is now going to underwrite a peace agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia? I am very, very skeptical. Uh, I think we'll have to wait and see. I don't think it will. Uh, does that mean that we are going to see Chinese forces being deployed in other countries to underwrite peace deals and China is going to go around the world to create this four, again, alphabet soup framework of security, which is, you know, sustainable and so on and so forth? I highly doubt it. One of the key terms in GSI that's been used is that, you know, security is indivisible, Mm -hmm. which is essentially a shot at what Beijing sees as the United States' view of security, which is that it is in the format of blocks, and China is saying you don't have blocks, you actually have indivisible security where everybody's security is fundamentally linked to each other. So you each have a stake in it. It talks about, which is again, great narrative, great rhetoric. It talks about security, uh, you know, so it talks about respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity. I'm not going to use the Ukraine example. I'm going to use the CPEC and LAC example. Clearly, sovereignty and territorial integrity have not been respected. So I think that a lot of this is, Really smart sounding rhetoric, which again has significant purchase in large parts of the developing world, particularly as the developing world is concerned about what's happened with the war in Ukraine and the downstream impacts of that war on the developing world. And what they see as the United States' policy, which is unpredictable given the domestic politics of the United States and the impact of sanctions on the developing world. So this is Really, you know, smart rhetoric and the anxieties that, say, countries in East Asia and our part of the world have with regard to, say, bipolarity and, you know, sort of a new Cold War sort of emerging between China and the United States. This is useful rhetoric in that context. But to me, I mean, large parts of the GSI are basically about China's interests rather than going around with great benevolence to solve the world's problems. 
And some of those uh, interests, I mean, I've sort of in the paper that you referenced, I've written sort of three types of actions under GSI. You know, one would be traditional security measures where you would be seeing drills, you'd be seeing joint policing and training operations. Um, In fact, the GSI concept paper talks about a couple of thousand training opportunities for GSI partner countries. It also talks about something like creating a demonstration zone for GSI in the Lansong Mekong region. We don't know what the demonstration zone will be like, but to me, it sounds a lot like joint law enforcement operations to deal with, say, drugs, goods, illegal goods trade, trafficking of people, because that's the challenge over there. Maybe disaster management and things like that. So to me, that's a, there's a lot of law enforcement cooperation. Likewise, in Central Asia, I presume there's going to be a lot of law enforcement cooperation. I think at the SCO summit last year, also there was an announcement of two or 4,000 training opportunities for, I think, Kazakhstan. So I, I think those are the kind of things that we'll see. Law enforcement, security, that's one part set of actions under GSI. Another set of actions would be related to financial security sanctions. And we're seeing some of these steps being taken. So Brazil and China agreeing to trade in local currencies, talk of possibly, which is something that Malaysia talked about, talk of a Asian fund to sort of reduce dependence on the dollar. So I think different ways in which you can try and reduce your dependence on the US dollar uh, and to try and sanctions proof your trade. That is one part of GSI, um, but it may not be sort of discussed as GSI. And the third set of actions is sort of shaping global governance norms, whether those are regarding biosecurity, cybersecurity, human rights and things like that, or space, uh, to try and get countries together on common platforms so that you boost your negotiating power at the United Nations and you have a common proposition, particularly against the West. So to me, that's where GSI is essentially heading. But then again, it's early days. Uh, China says that they have, the Chinese government says that they have 80 countries that have appreciated GSI. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen any formal partners of GSI. I'll draw the distinction between GSI and GDI when we talk about GDI. But GDI has formal partners. GSI does not. Which also tells you a little bit about how countries have responded with a certain degree of apprehension to endorsing this initiative wholeheartedly. Right. Stay tuned to All Things Policy. We'll be right back after a short commercial break. And I think it may not have formal partners, but China continues to invest a lot of this diplomatic influence peddling in this to to kind of work towards winning as many endorsements for the GSI as possible without kind of projecting it in that blog based mentality, because that might lead to a reflection of anxieties for developing countries, as you've also argued in your paper. And uh, as as to joint policing I, and, you know, this move towards individual uh, currencies or grouped currencies to reduce dependence on the dollar. It's a lot in the news recently about what Malaysia talked about, then BRICS talking about its own currency and Yuan becoming a much a very influential currency in Russia. And I don't know if these are successes for the GSI, but it remains. I mean, I think a lot of this is, you know, packaging what are existing policy propositions within a framework. So none of this is, none of what we've said, talked about is necessarily new. I mean, right. the idea of modernization is not westernization. We've been hearing for more than a few years mm-hmm. now. But this is about how these ideas have led to certain policy formulations uh, and how these, I mean, look, Xi Jinping is a politician at the end of it, right? Politicians like big frameworks and slogans under which you can package your propositions because that's what sells, right? So it's not like BRI was invented when Xi Jinping thought of it. I mean, some of these investments that were then packaged as BRI were happening even before BRI existed. Um, But then they were packaged under that because, you know, uh, politicians prefer it and also people realize that it's useful to do that. It gets easier access to finance and things like that. So some of this is repackaging of existing policy objectives and some of this is providing a framework for what may have been disparate set of actions and giving it direction, right. um, which again can infuse some degree of urgency in the, in the steps that you may be taking. So to me, that's how I would look at what's happening in this GSI and GCI. Right, right. Absolutely. And so so from that, we'll move to the GDI and the, the differences between the GSI and the GDI that you talked about. To me, GDI feels uh, relatively more benevolent in the sense that China picks these issues like poverty, alleviation and public health and supporting developing countries and ultimately 
influence peddling and projecting uh, the Chinese as, you know, absolutely concerned uh, with the progress of developing countries and, you know, um, making sure that all of their um, economic and developmental concerns are alleviated. And I, I think the infrastructural investments under the BRI also uh, projected to have a lot of those aims and goals. So a little less than two years on into the initiative, what has the GDI actually achieved in terms of these goals? And and again, like to hear more about what do you think the primary differences between the GSI and GDI are and and what value does the GDI hold for China's broader strategy, say, on cooperation with developing countries? Because like you said, none of these things are very new. But then this then, but then does this packaging really enhance or influence its relations with the developing world in significant way? Okay, let me answer the first question. Last question first. Yeah. And does the packaging really influence China's perception? I think Beijing hopes that it will. I think the jury is still out on that. I'm not sure that that is the case. But I think that's the one part of the agenda. GDI is uh, China's response to the, you know, our, one of the four deficits, the development deficit, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's uh, not replacing BRI. It's not, you know, uh, it's unlike the BRI in that it does not entail tremendous financing. Mm-hmm. BRI entails lots of money being pumped in by Chinese policy banks, largely in infrastructure, transport, energy projects, largely around the world, along with other things, but predominantly energy and transport have been the big parts of BRI. GDI is not that. China is not pumping billions and billions of dollars to undertake projects in third countries. Instead, what it's done with GDI is that it's created some sort of a participatory mechanism where it's looking at some of the Softer issues, uh, softer is a wrong word actually, but it's essentially linked it to the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, the 2030s SDGs. And it said that we would launch this initiative to try and help countries meet those targets and those goals under the SDGs. So therefore, the projects under BR, under GDI are essentially linked to the Sustainable Development Goals, right? So they are projects around poverty reduction, uh, pandemic response, health, vaccines, food security, water, sanitation, uh, women's empowerment and things like that, which are essentially linked to, uh, you know, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. What they have done so far is that they have organized uh, 60 countries which are part of a group of friends at GDI at the Mm -hmm. United Nations. Most of these are developing all of these are developing countries uh, unfortunately there's no single list that i could find of these 60 countries but you know in september 2022 the group of friends of gdi announced 50 projects that list of projects is available uh, online for anybody who wants to look at them mm-hmm. there are a bunch of countries listed over there and you can take a look at which the partner countries are um, and all of them are essentially developing countries and east asian countries some countries in the pacific islands so that's the objective. And if you also look at the projects that are being undertaken and the who is implementing the projects, what you will see is that there are Chinese government agencies such as the Ministry of Commerce, uh, the development agency SITCA, or, and they are partnering with regional agencies, but also UN agencies in carrying out yeah. these projects. So it's much more participatory in that sense. And it's not as cost intensive as say BRI is. And the returns are therefore much more smaller. The objective therefore is to try and achieve help countries meet SDGs and as a consequence of it, sort of undermine and undercut the idea of China being this predatory economic actor, right? Right. Create the image of China being this partner in development as opposed to a predatory economic actor. And I think that's really smart. Now, whether that's going to have an impact, I'm not necessarily sure that that will, because it depends on how many countries, how these countries view partnership with China? What do they see as beneficial in partnering with China? And so far, data tells us that predominantly developed, the developing world views China as a partner in terms of developing infrastructure largely, rather than necessarily uh, in governance, law, uh, you know, rule of law development and, you know, health and these outcomes. So I think this is a smart strategy to pivot and to do that. And I agree with you. I mean, I wouldn't use the word benevolent, but I would use the word benign. That is, a lot of GSI, GDI is fairly benign. And I think countries beyond those 60, have also somehow obliquely engaged with this, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, when the BRICS summit happened last year, it was followed immediately by this high-level dialogue on global development to which India was a participant also, right? And India is not a friend of GDI, right? But India was a participant in that. And there are elements of GDI which I think are simply non-controversial, you know. Uh, That high-level dialogue also ended with some 31 outcomes. Mm -hmm. Most of those to me are straightforward, non-controversial. So say, reduce the use of plastics, increase the use of bamboo, 
it's fine but there are challenges in that also some of those things talk about improving port connectivity smart port operations and uh-huh. things like that which can have cyber security challenges who builds their infrastructure so right. there are areas where there can be challenges but by and large to me it is non controversial to me i would define the objectives as follows uh, one is to essentially leverage china's development and build soft connectivity appeal discourse power in these countries essentially demonstrating china as a benign partner in development the second is to essentially address some of the development challenges in the global south for example poverty in the global south or poor health outcomes can also impact chinese interests right. so you want to actually address some of these challenges uh, and finally you know push back against what it sees as western efforts to delegitimize china's economic diplomacy to push back against the debt trap narrative you demonstrate yourself as a partner which is beyond looking at just economic returns but is also looking at investing in development of society and healthcare outcomes and poverty related outcomes so i think that's the sort of threefold agenda with gdi and i don't see that as terribly problematic but it right. does fit into this broader idea of a narrative contest with the west right right i think i have uh, one last kind of question or maybe a set of questions uh, as as we end this podcast so so right you mentioned india is not a member of the gdi group of friends because some of its elements are simply non controversial but i'd like to come back to a point you made about one of the tenets of gsi and how india does indeed view them as controversial because they are as they directly impinge upon our national security interests so um, the gsi uh, makes a lot of talk about respecting sovereignty territorial integrity it also says i think uh, one of uh, the chinese diplomats uh, wrote a, in the indian media that india and china will have to cooperate to bring about a stable and secure asia and that's very important for the global security initiative but at the same time and we've talked about this before there isn't any the, the, there is a lot of difference between rhetoric and reality because there is no diplomatic moderation towards india the indian border remains unstable and the cooperative and sustainable security model isn't really applicable in india's case and you know then, then this uh, india china argument also extends to the gci where china is saying that oh we respect all civilizations or uh, you know your civilizational integrity is your own uh but at the same time um when when there is a discussion about two civilizations in asia rising rapidly and um occupying two poles of the emerging regional order china has a problem with india as a pole so i guess my final question to you is um how how exactly where exactly does india figure in the vision for gci gsi or gdi and how do these impact our kind of national developmental or security objectives look i think that what we should be thinking about what india should be thinking about in this context is that yes there are pieces of this that you can pick and choose that can work for you so say elements of gdi projects or whatever um can work for you and it's fine to uh, work on them where they are in common interest one need not be entirely obstructionist particularly when something is participatory being done with un agencies and all of that the challenges with gci and gsi these are likely to reshape our external environment right okay. um in some ways china's engagement in the middle east is changing to what degree i think one needs to still wait and see but this increased proactiveness in chinese diplomacy is shaping our external environment so for example if china brings peace between saudi arabia and iran you know and 5 years from now uh, there is a normal relationship between these two countries proxy conflict has stopped and there is some sort of peace that has been achieved in on a net basis that's good for india there is absolutely no issue with that and if china can underwrite that peace and use its armed forces to do that um it brings certain challenges for us because you see chinese military presence in our in west asia which brings problems for us but if that doesn't happen you know that that brings its own challenges but beyond that i think if there is peace without enhanced chinese military engagement that may not necessarily be net bad for india but if that comes with increased chinese military engagement increased chinese sinicization of these countries forces that can be a challenge for us so it reshapes our external environment in one way and we have to see in which way that particularly gci does that um if there is greater use of local currencies in trade across the world what does that do to sort of our trade also i think it's something that we need to think about whether that's beneficial or not depends on how things turn out if it allows us with greater options like say we've needed greater options in our trade with russia right now then it's fine it's benefits but we need to see the 
at a tactical level things may benefit us but at the strategic level does it make our environment much more secure because the rest of our rest of asia and the indo pacific becomes more dependent on china and what does that then do to us at a strategic level so while we may celebrate uh, or at least some quarters may celebrate the decline of us influence i think it's important for us to see what is the strategic effect of that on our security particularly if it comes at the cost of increased chinese influence so that's one thing that i think we need to take care of in terms of gci it's the same idea if at a sort of you know instinctive level i can see that you know there will be communities in india that we groups in india which may think that it makes complete sense you know mm-hmm. uh, we are a civilization and the west should not be dictating to us and so on and so forth and i agree you know there should be no external interference in how india organizes its societies and india's internal battles are india's internal battles but i think at the same time it's important to think about what is the implication of the erosion of liberal ideas of freedom of thought of freedom of expression of freedom to assemble when it becomes okay for societies to do whatever it is that they want to do it's not about the west coming and wielding and stick and saying that you can't do this it's about when you inherently erode belief in something like this in these liberal ideas what does that do to your societies mm-hmm. how do multicultural societies like ours end up balancing the tensions that exist what is the change in the nature of the relationship between the citizen and the state all of that impacts because it what happens in the region will also have an impact on us so i think that we need to be very very careful about what this influence does to the overall thought process on the erosion of liberal values because those liberal values have benefited india whether it is liberal economic values whether it is liberal social values is beijing doing this and demonstrating that it's okay for societies to crack down on dissent in the way it does or you know it's okay for women's rights to be you know secondary does you know does all of that impact if all of that is okay then does it also reinforce regressive views in our society uh, and is that the way in which we want society to go so i think it's not so much a tactical thing of you know this little change here that little change there i think it is important to keep in mind the strategic environment that changes the thought environment and how that will change and what that will what impact of that will be on in the future of india and future of discourse in indian policy mm-hmm. also again you know if it's okay for societies to be governed a certain way uh, and uh, what is the impact on indian businesses operating mm-hmm. in some of these countries uh, does that increase friction i think all of those kind of things i think uh, we'll have to take again this is not in the immediate future but this is if these initiatives were to achieve the outcomes that shri jinping is talking about this is one of the outcomes that we will end up facing so uh, i think that we need to be very cognizant of that because this is essentially framing a sinocentric if not world at least region mm-hmm. and that is not necessarily in our interest uh, whether it is in our security interests our economic interests or also our sort of interest in terms of the liberal values that the indian state uh, stands for so i think that's what we need to be mindful of and therefore what we need to do is also partly you know engage in much more assertive diplomacy to at least try and demonstrate that democracies work liberal values matter at home and abroad and also that uh, you know uh, if you talk about respecting sovereignty and territorial integrity then that should not be just cheap talk mm-hmm. uh, you must be doing that mm-hmm. so we need to be highlighting where that's not happening uh, and even to countries in our region we should be talking to them about how while beijing may be saying that it's not interested in inter- interfering in your internal affairs look at nepal look at pakistan look at sri lanka beijing is very very active in the internal affairs of these countries yeah. um it may not be doing it like the united states may be doing it but it is very very active yeah. and it's important for us to highlight that and this is not a new trend go back to mao era uh, under mao the communist party was actively pursuing communist uh, supporting communist movements in other countries so it's not like there is no history of chinese in- engagement in internal affairs of other countries but this is in a different form and i think it's important for us to highlight that right i think uh, in my opinion india has 
always faced um, these um, dilemmas and questions of balancing internal values with, say, the West promulgated universal values and uh, between, you know, tactically adjusting to mutually beneficial initiatives while strategically assessing what impi- impact or implications it may have for Chinese influence in the region. And um, I think the introduction of these initiatives has only exacerbated the extent to which we now have to think about these questions. I think the challenge there is this uh, and just exactly like how you put it. The identification of what are liberal progressive values with simply the West as though those are Western is to me problematic, right? Freedom is a universal value. Uh, How societies regulate their freedom or regulate freedom within their sort of territorial space, within their sovereign space, how states and societies do that is a matter for states and societies to take care of. Yet, just because there is sovereignty does not mean that the value that you know that the value that we're talking about of freedom can be completely clamped down on and you can call repression as freedom you know and the lack of democracy as democracy just because you can do it we are a civilization of our own exactly you yeah. it, that to me is problematic and to me what some of these initiatives as do particularly gci will be doing and is doing is acknowledging that so as much as i am all for What Xi Jinping says that the world must not be a garden with one flower and there must be a garden with many flowers and whatever and let hundred flowers bloom of civilization and all of that stuff. I'm all fine with that. But at the end of the day, it's important to keep in mind that there are some of these values which are, which we have learnt over hundreds of years, which we have, which have been cultivated and which have benefited the world. We should not be throwing them out just because we want to adhere to some degree, some sense of a civilizational narrative. I mean, if you go back to the Indian civilization history also, I mean, I'm not an expert, but Mm. uh, you know, you will see tremendous debate within India about say LGBTQ rights and each can draw from different civilizational, you know, perspectives of, you know, India's sort of comfortable uh, history, uh, India's history with say, you know, same sex couples and all of that. So you can, you can have lots of different views based on the Indian civilization narrative, but just but the undermining of liberal ideas and as attaching that regression yes. with civilizational ideas, to me, that's problematic. I don't know if I've explained this well, but that is the idea. No, I, th- I think it makes complete sense. And on that note, thank you so much, Manoj. That was a very insightful conversation. With this, we'll come to the end of the podcast. A big thank you to our listeners as well for tuning in. Thank you. Bye-bye. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle, at Takshashila INST or our website takshashila.org.in.